Welcome back to Smarty Van. Today we're in Springdale, Utah where the skies are sunny. All systems are looking good. Starlink is connected with a download speed of 118 megabits per second. Current solar generation is at 180. That's right. Our van talks to us, but that's not what today's video is about. Today's video is about dashboards. And if you saw the very first video that this channel ever made, then you've seen a tour of this home dashboard. But today we're going to talk about some of the other dashboards here across the top and dig a little deeper. It's not a video about how to make dashboards or the exact configuration files for ours, but I wanna give you a look around so you can see what we've done in our van and maybe you can replicate that in yours. If you have questions, drop them in the comments and maybe we'll make a future video on exactly how to program one of these dashboards, but today's just a tour. All right, let's get to work. Okay, let's talk Home Assistant dashboards. If you don't know anything about Home Assistant, take a look at this playlist and jump back to the beginning where I've got some guides for you to get up and running with Home Assistant and get a server set up for yourself. If you do have Home Assistant set up, perhaps the tour of our dashboards will inspire yours. It's important to note that our Home Assistant install is in a van. It's a 2022 4x4 Sprinter that my partner Shar and I built to live in full time. So it's home automated, but it's a home on wheels. So there are some special considerations. So our dashboard pages cover everything from HVAC to our motorized bed, magnetic drawer locks, there's a video about those here, and lighting, water systems, and beyond. So our system is tailored to living in a van, but this would also apply to your home automation system in your home without wheels. All right, let's dig in. Let's go back to our main dashboard and do a little recap. Okay, down the left column here, we have weather, temperature sensors, a forecast, and our solar production, as well as sunrise and sunset times. And across the top, we have location information, including a reverse geocoded address. This is the nearest address to our current location. And if there are any US weather alerts, those will show up here too. All of this information is based on GPS coordinates, and we pull that from our Peplink router. Our Peplink router has an API, and we pull in the GPS coordinates every so often, and we update things like weather and location. I use automations to vary how frequently those things are updated based on whether the van is moving or not. Below that, we have some quick glance icons that show presence detection here, whether any of the doors are open, the glycol temperature for the Rixons heating system, and some internet indicators like ping speed, cellular signal level, and Starlink status as well as our YouTube subscriber count. Below that, we have a bunch of our most commonly used buttons. This is everything from lights to bed controls and our Rixons hot water, the water pump, Starlink, the magnetic drawer lock system, the inverter, subwoofer, and this button is for an automation that thermostatically controls the max air fan based on the internal ambient temperature. Below that, we have our magic drawer button, which opens and closes our linear actuated drawer that serves both as a storage space and a step up into our bed when the bed is down. Then we have some lighting controls here at the bottom with two scenes and specific controls for kitchen light, which we use the most. To the right, we'll see Spotify controls if Spotify is playing on any of our devices. Below that are manual max air fan controls and controls for our Arctic Turn hatch, which is above the bed. Then we see HVAC controls. If it's warm in the van, we'll see the state of the air conditioning, and if it's cool in the van, we'll see the state of the Rixons heating system. Below that is a summary of our electrical system with our state of charge, the battery voltage, and the solar production. Then we have gray tank and freshwater levels, and our DC load, which changes to AC load if the inverter is turned on. Then we see diesel level and CPU percentage of our Raspberry Pi server running home system. Many of the buttons on this page lead to other pages, like the bed button. This takes us into all the bed controls and the related controls that we would use at nighttime when we're getting ready for bed. At the top, we have controls to lower and raise the bed, and then the bed lift switch, which is like a safety switch. If this switch isn't on, then the bed can't be controlled. This helps us avoid accidentally tapping any of the bed controls and having the bed move when we're sitting underneath it. All the other controls here are related to bedtime. This one is our shutdown button, and really, that goes through a whole list of things. It turns off things like the water pump, the inverter, and it starts a Starlink sleep timer, which will shut down the Starlink after a period of time if we fall asleep while watching TV. We also have a scene here to turn just the bedroom lights off if one of us is staying up and the other is trying to go to sleep. Back to the home page here, if we click on the electrical overview button here, that takes us to our first sub page. 
Tips. This is our electrical page, and most of this information is pulled from the Serbo GX, which is part of our Victron energy system. Victron supports both MQTT and Modbus, and we're using MQTT to pull all of this information into Home Assistant. MQTT also allows for bi-directional control, so we could turn the inverter on and off. And if we turn the inverter on, that reveals controls that allow us to set how many amps we want shore power to pull if we're charging. At the top, we have our remaining runtime. This is calculated by the Serbo GX, and we just pull that in here. Our last full charge is something that we're calculating based on the last automatic sync with the BMS system and the Victron energy system. Below that are battery stats like voltage, DC amps, and DC power, and if we're on shore power, we'll see how many watts we're pulling there. Below that is alternator charging stats, and we'll get to that on another page here soon. In the middle, we have a nice visualization that shows the various sources of power and their consumption into the van. Below that is our DC load and AC load if the inverter is on, and below that we can see the mode of our inverter. On the right column, we have inside temperature and outside temperature, and then we have solar production at the moment, as well as solar current. Then we have some stats for today's solar yield as well as yesterday's solar yield. Below that, we see devices that have a battery level under 20% so we can keep our eye on charge levels. Okay, let's take a look at another sub page. Let's go to lighting. This is a pretty simple page that just reveals controls for every light we have in the van, as well as scenes across the top. We can also turn off every single light in the van with one click here. Okay, let's go to another sub page. Let's go to water levels. Across the top here, we have three leak detectors. And these are placed in the most vulnerable areas where we could see a leak from some plumbing, where the glycol is, where the water tank is, and where the shower plumbing is. Then we have a gray tank temperature sensor, and this sensor helps us monitor what's going on with our gray tank and if it's getting close to freezing. On the left, we have water levels. We have total gallons of our fresh water and our gray tank level. Below that, this shows our primary and aux tank levels. Inside, we have a 38 gallon tank over the wheel well, and outside we have an 11 gallon tank under the sliding door. Then we see the gallons that are available in each of those tanks. In the middle here, we have six valves. These are mostly controlled by automations, but we can also manually open and close these valves to do various things with our plumbing. For instance, this button here runs an automation that tops off the primary tank using the auxiliary tank from outside and uses our main water pump to pull that water up into the tank inside. The primary to aux tank valve allows the primary tank to gravity feed the aux tank outside. And the fresh dump valve, of course, dumps the aux tank there. So if we want to dump both tanks, we can open the primary to aux and the fresh dump, and the water will flow from the inside primary tank to the outside aux tank, and then out to the ground. We can also dump the gray tank from here. The fill select valve allows us to use one Acor water inlet on the outside of the van and choose whether that's being used to fill our tank with city pressure water or to use it as a hot shower outside. On the right, we have heat and freeze protection controls like our water pump, hot water button, and a preheat water button. We have a circuit in our plumbing that runs around all of the fixtures in the van and allows us to preheat the water in that loop to bring hot water closer to each of the fixtures before it's used. So we use a small impeller pump to move the water around that circuit and we can control that here. Whenever we ask for hot water and the Rickson's heating system brings the glycol up to temperature, then this preheat pump is turned on for a short period of time to preheat the water in that loop. At the bottom, we have freeze protection circuits, one for our gray tank and one each for our shower and sink drain lines. Okay, let's go to one of my favorite pages. This is the HVAC control page, which has controls for the Rickson's heat system, as well as the undermount AC system. On the Rickson side, if we turn on hot water, heating the water with furnace and engine, we get an announcement of which of our three heat sources are being used, and then we'll see the furnace go into its cold start mode, and the glycol temperature will start to rise as the furnace heats up the glycol. The undermount AC system is fairly simple. It has one key button here that allows the compressor to be used in high mode, but if that's off, then the compressor will stay in its low mode, and we'll just try to reach the set point. We also have separate controls for the fan if you just want to use the blower as a fan to move some air around in the van. Both of these systems are using ESP Home and YAML that I've written to control these separate systems. Before we move on, I'll just point out the sensors at the top. We have our forecasted weather as well as sensors inside and outside the van so we can see the temperatures. All right, let's go to our weather subpage. This dashboard combines a couple weather sources here to give us a big picture of what's going on. We have two iframes that embed windy.com pages for both the rain and thunder, as well as the radar for our exact location using the GPS coordinates from our Peplink router. We repeat the temperature sensors across the top here, and if there are national weather alerts, those will be displayed here. Then on the right, we're using a weather API called Pirate Weather to pull the weather forecast for our current GPS location. 
Okay, moving on, we're gonna go to our camera page. We have three cameras mounted up on top of the van, one on the driver's side, the passenger side, and one facing the rear. We're using a DVR system called Frigate that is an add-on for Home Assistant, so this is all running on the same Raspberry Pi. Then we're using a device called a Coral, made by Google, that has machine learning capabilities that is connected to the Raspberry Pi via USB. Anytime Frigate detects motion, it sends those frames over to the Coral, which then evaluates those with machine learning to see if there's a person or an animal detected in those frames. All of this footage is being recorded to the same micro SD card that's running our entire Raspberry Pi. The footage is saved for a couple of days and even longer if an object was detected like a person or an animal. Just like you might with Nest, we get alerts on our phone when we're away from the van and a person is detected in any of the zones that we've configured on these cameras. Okay, let's take a look at our networking page. This page shows all of our network stats, including the Peplink router and the Starlink internet connection. On the left, we have our ping speed, controls to turn Starlink off or on, and a button to launch the Peplink admin page. And then we see speed test results. We don't run these speed tests continuously, which would use up a lot of our data. Instead, we use automations to only run a speed test on a major event, like Starlink being turned off or on, or us arriving at a new location. Below that, we see our internet connection over the last 48 hours, and below that, we see our Starlink connection over the last 48 hours. The Peplink controls and entities here are pulled in via the Peplink API directly from the router, and Starlink has an integration in Home Assistant so that you can pull these entities in from your Starlink directly. At the top, we see our ping speed again, the connection status of Starlink, then we see the cellular connection level of each of our two SIM cards, as well as our GPS status here from our Peplink. All right, moving on, we'll go to the media page. This page has controls for our Nebula Capsule 3 projector, and when that's turned on, we have direct control to launch any of these apps, as well as control of our projector screen. And then we have our amplifier controls and the ability to turn off and on the zones, our front and rear speakers, as well as the subwoofer embedded in the wall of the van. And then at the top, of course, we have our YouTube watch hours and subscriber account. Okay, next is our music page. This is kind of like the media page, but it's focused on Spotify and our speaker system. If Spotify is playing, we'll see the album artwork here and controls for Spotify. And then we see volume controls for both our announcements and the amplifier overall. And again, we repeat our speaker controls for front and rear zones, as well as the subwoofer. Next, we have presence detection. This dashboard is pretty straightforward and gives an overview of where each of us are located and whether we're home or away, as well as some of our device charge levels, and we can see the number of steps we've each taken for the day. At the top, we see the location of the van, as well as our distance traveled on our entire journey and the length of time we've been on the road. Then we see whether the doors are closed and we have controls to lock and unlock the Sprinter van doors. The last dashboard that I want to show you is one that's specially designed for the cab of the Sprinter that we use while driving. You can see that it's designed for a slightly smaller screen, but it has a summary of all the controls that we might want to see while driving. We have weather and location data again, as well as solar production, and we have the stats for our alternator charging. So as long as this allow alternator switch is turned on and then the van's ignition is turned on, our home assistant system will tell the wake speed relay to turn on and that will start the charging process from the alternator to our battery bank. We also have an entity here that calculates our range. Our van has an aftermarket fuel tank, so it's larger than the stock fuel tank, and that makes the Sprinter's range estimation a little bit off. So we do some math here to adjust for that, and we get a more accurate range for our current diesel level. On the right side here, we have controls for all of our exterior lighting. That's right, we're not using an S-Pod or Switch Pro or anything like that. We actually built our own controls so that we can integrate them into Home Assistant. And we can use automations to control these. So anytime the ignition turns on, our daytime running lights come on, which includes a small strip up in the light bar, as well as DRLs in the grill lights. We have a switch that turns on our ARB compressor, which works in conjunction with the hard switch that's in the dashboard. Below that, we can see the diesel fuel level of the van, as well as the def level. And below that, we see levels for our battery, fresh water, and gray tanks. Then we have a switch to open our gray dump valve from the cab. And below that, we have some little indicators here. These are almost like diagnostics for me to keep an eye on when I'm driving. And this one shows if the engine's on. This little one shows if the van is in motion. And then we have a speedometer, which is again, pulled from the GPS signal from the Peplink. Then I can keep my eye on the Rickson's glycol level, as well as internet stats like our ping speed, cellular connection, and Starlink status. Then we have an icon that shows our presence detection. Then we see battery voltage, and we have a service mode. 
Surface mode is an automation that I built that if we turn on, will prevent things like the electromagnetic door locks from unlocking and from automations like lights coming off and on so that if we take the van in for service, the service providers aren't confused as to what's going on. Then we see a button and status for our drawer locks as well as our GPS signal quality and finally our YouTube subscriber count. All right, there's an overview of all the dashboards we use in our van. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you have questions or ideas, drop them in the comments below and good luck with your dashboards. Until next time, safe travels.